All right. I would now like to take the opportunity to welcome the second keynote speaker of the SAN conference, Anne Lee Steele. Anne is, a, is the community manager for the Turing Way project at the Allen Turing Institute, where she facilitates a collaborative resource for reproducible data science and supports an open source community in developing practices for researchers and practitioners around the world. She has worked on a variety of projects in the open ecosystem, including at the Internet Society, Wikimedia Deutschland and Open Knowledge Foundation and is passionate about the capacity for open source practices to make research more accessible, collaborative and inclusive. Previously, she worked in the data journalism and education fields. Over to you, Anne. We are so fortunate to have you here. Thank you so much, Sayanjit. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here at the RSC Con Asia Australia and for this opportunity to share reflections about open knowledge and my somewhat long and winding path towards it. Um, when I was originally asked um, and invited to, to give this early career keynote, I admit that my first reaction was, what can a community manager share with a community of research software engineers? And I sat with this question for a few weeks and as I did, it became a much larger one. Um, what was the connection between the worlds I'd inhabited before joining open science and open research that weren't necessarily computational and the worlds that I inhabit now, populated by data scientists and other data-driven folk? And so I decided to get back to square one and map my own experiences over the past few years in the hope that someone might learn from my own or that something might be gleaned from it more broadly. And I realized that as I went and had gone from research to practice and back again, from the field of anthropology to journalism, to civic technology projects to open knowledge, and then eventually back to open scholarship as I am in now, um, I was combining the tools and practices and systems that I'd gained from each one of these spaces. And so I suppose another title of this short talk could be mapping my own open journey from research to practice and back again. And yes, there will be quite a few maps uh, in this short talk. And so just to start at the beginning, um, you'll see, and I'll promise I'll bring the Turing way back in later. I'm an anthropologist by training, and that means that we study culture defined really broadly. We look at the foundational questions of what bind us to each other, believing that there's you know, a lot that's changed since times of old, but not really all that much. And we connect these individual experiences, these experiences of rituals, of kinship, of belonging to wider processes um, and to wider phenomena, looking at how these social norms within the communities um, that we inhabit can speak to broader claims about our society at large. And to learn about this uh, means observing people for long periods of time, talking to them um, in something that's called ethnography, trying to figure out the differences between what people say and what people do. And as a student, many years ago, I had studied how local communities govern their natural resources in Bhutan and Nepal, especially in light of, or sometimes even despite, international climate regulation. And so when I left the academy and anthropology at first, it was actually to work with data. I was hungry to apply these perspectives in the world and joined a media lab of an international affairs think tank, which asked big questions of the world at large. We use data to learn more about it and to support policymakers to visualize the issues and make these processes more accessible and understandable. And in the process, I learned about other places that data was being used and about how it was being used, whether it's supporting human rights work, using technology all around the world, um, such as this group naming Shahidi here, or using satellite imagery to access and to assess environmental damage during wartime, as with the group Bellingcat. And citizen journalism, um, like these projects, felt like an alternative to the status quo, more focused on the collective as a source of knowledge and the capacity for people to write history by and for and with each other. And in the process, I'd learned from different groups that were creating this work in real time, um, realizing that there was, in many ways, a community of a communities that was producing and doing this work and kept each other accountable to changing journalism as we knew it and holding power to account. And so really my first introduction to the open world and what I'd learned from open source investigation and open news 
was one, hold the powerful to account using the tools that you know how to use. In that case, it was in journalism, um, using data, using data visualization. Two, collective power, in this case, always seemed to come from collaboration, um, from collaborative practices that brought people all around um, the world together in a way that was only really possible because of the digital medium. And three, community is everywhere, even in the most unexpected of places. I hadn't expected to find it in data journalism or data visualization, but I did. And of course, I thought of this quote, who in fact is by Margaret Mead, an anthropologist who said, never believe that a few caring people can't change the world, for indeed, that's all who ever have. And so funnily enough, I eventually returned back to the academy in the hope that I could take some of these learnings and these tools as a data journalist and maybe refine the questions a little bit better. They seemed to be circling around answers I couldn't quite put my finger on. And I, I originally entered with the idea of doing human rights work, but soon myself studying the practices behind them. Culture was everywhere, including the halls of the United Nations. And there were particular rituals and ways of working that proceeded there. I wanted to learn about how the idea of human rights work aligned or sometimes even did it with the practice of human rights practice itself. But in the spring of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and we all found ourselves at home. And of course, found myself asking these same questions in the online space. And in October, 2020, I participated in a humanitarian mapathon and edited a part of OpenStreetMap, the Wikipedia of maps. And you know, coming from a data journalism background, I'd realized that originally I would found would have found myself interacting with this project, asking questions like, you know, how can this map be used and what is it for? In what context could it be applied? But now I was asking questions like, who makes this map? Uh, who makes this tool? Why do they do it? What culture prevails in, um, in this map of the world? And I was thinking like an anthropologist again, rather than a data journalist, and was keen to try and combine both. Around the same time, I was lucky enough to be able to participate in um, what was called the Frictionless Data Fellowship through the Open Knowledge Foundation, where I was introduced to a lot of foundational questions about uh, open science and open scholarship. And this is where I actually first began to try and think through, like an anthropologist, but also like a data journalist, and also kind of combine the theory and practice of both together learned that interoperability in one field didn't necessarily look like interoperability within another. Um, reproducibility, what does that look like within the field of anthropology? Reproducibility, what does that look like within neuroscience, within, um, within physics, within uh, the many other fields uh, and fellows that were in this program? Of course, as introduced to the open access movement and to data's best practices, um, and ultimately learned while I was learning about OpenStreetMap and about the wide world of open knowledge and the people that create it, about the tools and practices and systems that define open science and the field that we're all a part of today. But had a little bit of a chance to be able to combine some of these skills together within the Wikimedia system. Again, really just filled with wonder with how in the world open knowledge has come to be the, the movement that it has. And so really, the more that I was able to be involved with these projects, I was learning in really another set of, of learnings here. One is that open is always context dependent um, and that it's important to never forget that. Um, in many cases, open was sometimes called the buy all and end all of a project. In other times, it needs to be customized for its specific use. I also learned that everything has a culture from open source communities like OpenStreetMap or Wikipedia to the culture of science itself. And if there's anything that I learned from open scholars and from folks within the open source software world, it was that what you make is as important as how you make it. Um, the theory always affects the practice. And of course, it always brought back this quote from Margaret Mead. So getting back to this map, of mapping my own journey from research to practice and back again. Now enters the Turing Way. I'd soon realized when I joined this project and in many ways in retracing uh, my own experiences in these various um, projects and fields within open knowledge and open science, within the open ecosystem more broadly, 
that the Turing Way itself was entering a culture. In many ways that it aims to try and change culture, to change science as we know it, to aim for a cultural shift within the fields, within scientific fields. Um, on one hand, to make reproducibility as important as the number of papers published, to change the culture of data science. Um, not so dissimilar from uh, the data journalists I'd first interacted with in the open, not in the open data ecosystem. Of course, um, as you all know, uh, reproducibility um, as an aim of culture change within open science stemmed from the crisis of reproducibility, from the crisis of the culture of the crisis of reproducibility. And so similarly, the Turing Way kind of in these foundations, uh, the project has been able to grow as it has uh, since 2019. And it's with these foundations in reproducibility or the lack thereof that Dr. Kirsty Whitaker in 2019 um, gathered together some of her closest allies across neuroscience and other fields um, to create the initial book, the, the um, book on reproducible research and it was with the second phase of Dr. Malvi Kasharan, who joined the project in the fall of 2019, that this book, which began with a book of reproducibility, was able to expand into six different books, um, realizing that to address the culture of science, um, which aims for reproducibility, or perhaps should, if it is aims to have cultural change, um, required many other aspects in order to do so. It required looking at the project design, um, the foundations of how and why you do your work. It has to address the art of communicating research, of um, being able to reach the widest audience possible, to be accessible for folks across different fields. Um, it's about being creating a culture of collaboration that you know, meets people where they are, and, but at the same time uh, is able to encourage the learning of new skills. Of course, it's also about asking the questions about ethics um, and about the foundations of how and why or for whom research is done. And finally, um, about documenting the best practices that are used within the community in order to share them with others as well. And so in many ways, the questions being asked here as I learned more about the Turing Way as community manager were, were really the same questions that I've asked of data journalism, of open knowledge, of open, um, source open source software project is that how do you change culture and what does collaboration with many people create and in many ways it creates books like the Turing Way and so there are many different ways that people have gotten involved and in many ways there are many there it became a, a culture of collaboration through a set of communities of communities with um, mentors, with maintainers, with um, communicators, with the book dash planning committee, with the translation and localization team, the folks who share and best practices. Um, and all of these different ways of contributing um, reminded me very much of these foundational movements within open knowledge. And so on one hand, you know, the open as it was defined, uh, within my original interaction with the project um, and with the world of open data was actually open for another means, open for improving equity, um, not only with an open scholarship, I realized, but this could apply really all across the ecosystem, that there are many different definitions, one of which is being used within the culture of science. And all of this, of course, should be used to further aims of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But, Another thing to point out here, though, is that this aim of creating and sustaining and maintaining open infrastructure uh, was really with the aim of supporting this culture change, right? And so this includes, you know, bringing in domain experts, bringing in statisticians, or people, folks who work with data, but also very much aiming to communicate with and for the public, and co coordinating all the folks involved in this process, of course, really really difficult. Um, and the more that I've learned from open scientists, the more that I realize um, the specific context of open science in which we operate and the barriers there. But 
really key to this, but the humans behind that process. And that's where I think community managers and research software engineers can learn a lot from each other, um, as well as data stewards, um, research application managers, which was a term recently incubated uh, and a new job uh, recently incubated at the Turing Institute. And it's all these different types of folks that form the infrastructure behind how research is done. Um, and it's something that many other parts and many other aspects of the open ecosystem can learn from what it actually means to support um, open, not necessarily just a practice of what you do with data, but the people behind that process in the first place. Another really integral aspect to this, this that I've learned from the Turing way is the importance of acknowledgement in this process. The act of crowdsourcing in many other contexts in open knowledge projects in um, open source investigative projects um, may not necessarily address this question of acknowledgement in the same way. I've learned a lot from how open science and in many ways, even the act of creating this, these slides themselves built upon the work of others. Um, and that acknowledgement process is really embedded all throughout uh, the Turing Waves of Project, but also within so many other projects within the open science ecosystem. Just another example here of how this is done. And it's really through the same process that I think that uh, these collaborative process is really what enables, has enabled the project to kind of reach into the places that it has so far. And so of course, what I've learned from the Turing Way, from Open Science, from all of you, and from speaking to folks uh, who are research software engineers who are within Open Science, who compose this research infrastructure is that these folks are really interested in culture change, that we all are in many ways a part of changing the culture of research, and that maybe all of us together and collectively can change the world of research itself. And so in retracing my own journey, I was wondering what yours would look like as well. What eventually brought you into the space of research software engineering and into research infrastructure and eventually into the culture change of science itself? And so mapping our experiences with open research, many ways I'd realized that mapping ourselves and our own experiences that got us here, maybe that exercise would be important for all of us in order to decide the best path forward collectively and as a community. This is just my little plug. Um, if you'd like to join the community at any point, uh, we'd love to see you at one of our community events online or in any space. But most importantly, thank you to the community of folks that have made a project like the Turn Me. Thank you all for listening to me this morning or evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and uh, thank you for being a part of the culture change of science. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I would now like to stop the recording so that we can move to the next part of the session.